I thought there's a little preface to the, um, to the show which um, uh, really just goes through I mean, um, how Steve and I, who set the business up, um, were friends from the late 70s um, and got together in um, 86 and started ARM officially in 88. But it is worth thinking that we studied and got together uh, in the 70s, in Melbourne of the 70s, when, it, when there was a lot of um, uh, discussion around exactly what Charles just mentioned about theatre being about the culture of a place, art being about the culture of a place, not so much in architecture, but certainly within the universities there was a lot of discussion about that. And um, so that um, sort of stain, you might say, stayed with us. We started to teach and practice in Melbourne in the 80s, and I mean, these are some of the influential <coughs> architects of that period. Um, Graham Gunn being the great uh, uh, teacher and, uh, and also um, activist, uh, architect Dimity Reed as well, and Peter Corrigan, which we will um, love dearly. Um, this is the culture that we've learned to practice in. This was the culture, in fact, Charles, when I was involved in very early on um, with a group of people to rewrite the awards. The original awards um, structure was um, public building and a house, and everything else couldn't possibly be architecture. So we rewrote the structure so that it would actually include commercial buildings. And um, I remember getting quite a lot of flack for that, uh, for that award, but it was about the, pro and I can remember in one instance where a commercial building couldn't possibly win because it was up against a primary school in the awards, pre-awards program, because everyone said, oh, commercial building, really, that can't be good. Um, the school is a much better outcome, so we had to restructure it, because all buildings have to carry the, the, uh, the cultural agenda, and that was always our, our proposition, and so um, we rewrote that. Um, we, did, we did a lot of things early on as a young practice. We taught, um, how and I taught really from 1980. Um, we did a lot of talks. Um, um, I was one of the co-founders of Transition Magazine, which allowed me to interview a whole lot of people, in, including the, the late um, uh, Hadid. Um, I had a very fun afternoon at John Bowling's then. Um, so these sorts of activities are cultural activities. Um, architectural practice is not just a business, it is actually being active and being a participant in the culture of a city. On the other hand, we're also technologists and we went digital very early. Um, and I heard a lecture by uh, an academic from um, uh, Columbia University who tracked digital space and the software that um, was used to create digital space. And interestingly, Australians and New Zealanders um, were like a year behind what was happening in the US. Um, this is one of our old computers, um, no. they're very traditional computers. <laughs> um, we were like a year behind what was happening in the US and it was because Australians were very good at early adopting and kind of that twitched wire and a bit of string um, method of doing stuff. And so we actually adopted that um, using uh, interesting other software, um, stuff before 3D Max and all that, um, to actually uh, make architecture. We, there was a lot of arguments, and there continues to be a little bit of this, it's gradually diminishing, although we just did a submission today, this morning in Perth, where we weren't allowed to present digitally. I had to go, what year are we? <laughs> <laughs> so the antagonism to the digital, the hand drawn and all that, that's the only way you can make architecture, we just said, no, that's rubbish. Um, the, it's the mind that makes architecture. These are just tools, and, we, and they do affect what you do, and, we, um, and they actually affect how, what you can make, and they affect what you can make in a positive way. Story Hall was um, done, um, designed digitally. Um, it took like two or three hours to regenerate these sorts of um, uh, images when you used Hide, for those who remember. Um, but to actually, it was created in 1992 in a very early AutoCAD software, um, Federation Square. We didn't win it. I've almost <laughs> got over that. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I can talk to Don Bates. Yeah. <laughs> um, 1997 was done digitally and done a lot of animation and a lot of form. Uh, and in fact, the model was made as a digital model um, from very early paper, paper cut models. Um, Agile said, we design, when we design, we work from ideas. We like to um, have a cultural proposition. We also like to have an idea, an operational idea. In this case, this is an art, um, uh, performing art centre in Joondalup in Western Australia, which works off the, the, the local landscape, has a lot of this limestone, um, it's under, um, underpinned by limestone, but it's, in many areas it's washed away, and there's these sort of pinnacles that stick out. So the building, which is, this is the building, um, is actually made by using digital um, technology which allows you to erode a, a thing, a three-dimensional form, and give us this shape for the building. We've always been interested in the copy. Um, so the idea of copying uh, uh, as a cultural act. Um, the top one is um, how it's designed for the AASIS building, the um, uh, Aboriginal Studies Centre at the National Museum of Australia, which is the black swan to the white swan of Corb's um, uh, Villa Savoie. My version of Tristram Zara's house um, in uh, a very early and cheap little house that we did in South Yarra uh, by Adolf Loos. Um, and there's a great tradition of it in Australia. Australia, um, not only is there a tradition of copying, there is a tradition of assessing the quality of architecture by the success of the copy. So um, JJ Clark's Treasury Building is a cost is a copy of an Italian villa by San Savino. And um, Harry Seidler, he wouldn't admit it. <laughs> but in fact, this is a Breyer House. Um, I think it's the Blake House. Um, and it's very similar in plan to um, Harry's. This idea that um, we are constantly inventing new things is just not true. Um, architecture is actually about recycling ideas and reusing ideas and in fact it, making them fresh and revealing things about the original. Um, one of the things that uh, we've also been interested in is this sort of opposite to the physical form, which is kind of the, the negative of the physical form. So um, there are a number of projects where we've used the idea of a cast. In this case, um, for illustration, um, the Melbourne Recital Hall um, is actually made, this is a, a, a polystyrene packer that comes with your old uh, monitor for your, for your computer. That's the monitor there. And we use that as a sort of, um, as the idea of a container for something that's not there inside. And I mean, this is a very early computer diagram of it, and that's the, the physical form that we ended up with. So this idea of the sort of making things out of a, an inferred uh, element that isn't there. Um, probably the most famous one of that is the cast of the knot at the National Museum of Australia, which is, that is the cast of the knot, um, a carrot bend knot, um, which actually made the Great Hall. Um, this was quite difficult to build, but um, <laughs> the wonders of computer um, um, form making and then the ability to track the whole of the outside surface. If only Woodson had had such powerful computers. Um, imagery, also we use imagery a lot. Um, this is actually a little apartment building in St Kilda, which um, being opposite uh, Luna Park and Mr Moon, we took um, Dali's uh, somnambulist um, face and profiled it and then extruded it around the, around the building. The operational, which is really um, using um, scripting and using um, um, computer technology to make elements, in this case it's, a like, it's like the cast, um, to actually create the space. This is um, the extension to um, Hamer Hall, um, uh, Dervish. Clement Meadmore's Dervish is just here. And so what we did is we took the Meadmore and actually created it this string that ran through the front of the building that allowed us to carve it. Now there's a whole lot of um, discussion, and I think I've got some slides on this later, about the idea of the Yarra, um, how the Yarra was made by, as a, as a meandering line, carved um, by an elder uh, from the, the mountains down to the sea. So this sort of snaky element was a kind of 
intended to carry that, that line. We're also interested in um, architectural transgressions, that is, um, the idea that um, there, is a, there is a true line about what constitutes architecture can be constantly tested by transgressing that line, whether in the case of, um, you know, there's a tradition of architects to make models that are white card models and they look wonderful, or even wooden models. In this case, um, the St Gilda Library is a model that's made as a um, cushion. Um, in fact, it's got a zip in the back you can put your pyjamas in. <laughs> or in this case, it's a house in South Australia I did, which is done as a ceramic or an ornament for your um, sideboard. We've always been interested in the local. Um, so, I think that's an EK Holden. Um, when, you, when we look at the EK Holden, we think that's a beautiful thing. And then when we see the shed, we think, oh, it's all the proportions are all wrong, it's too long, it's got too high. So the idea that we are trained to understand um, our environment and what constitutes uh, beauty by understanding what we see as we, where we live, um, we've always been interested in that as a sort of challenge to the idea that beauty comes from somewhere else. Um, uh, yeah. I always think of Carlo Scarpa, um, Carlo Scarpa, Northern Italian. He did spend a little bit of time in the US, but not much, and it was later in life. His whole vision of what he did related to what he knew in northern Italy. He wasn't a great world traveller, etc. You think, ah, oh, that's us, that's we, you know, go up to Chapel Street and we see some old buildings, oh, that's, that must be what uh, our, where our architecture comes from, not from somewhere else. So we have local heroes, um, you know, the, the great Dione and Peter McIntyre house, um, uh, Haddon's amazing little collage of Anselm, um, this sort of uh, history of Australian architecture, Victorian architecture, becomes then something of precious and for us to study. And we do it deliberately. In fact, at the Albury um, uh, Library and Museum, we effectively took various elements, um, the bridge that crosses the Murray, um, which was you know, sort of the defining, uh, the railway bridge, defining reason for Albury to exist, to the idea of post-war reconstruction in Australia where the South Yarra Library um, is, you know, that's the, that's the ants' pants, that's the future. So we abstract the Misi and, um, um, what would you call it, sort of roots of the South Yarra Library and then also um, Enrico Taglietti's um, Canberra Library uh, Dixon at uh, Dixon um, turned into this, this <coughs> end bastion. And that's actually an assemblage of what the building is. Um, one particular project, which I'll do in a little bit of detail, I better keep my eye on the time, um, which is the Geelong Library and Heritage mm -hmm. Centre. Um, and this, this goes to that thing about trying to find a discourse with the community and a discourse with the project. But the interesting thing about the, the, the library is it's situated, that's the old library, situated on the edge of the um, main civic precinct with its 19th century buildings and middle century buildings and the park, and the park representing sort of the, the green heart of Geelong. And it's, it's a very powerful space. The garden itself is actually a, um, a drained um, sort of little swamp, but the dish of it actually is quite a beautiful um, garden. And the garden um, um, that was designed um, at the same time as the town hall um, is actually a very beautiful garden. So you get this sense of it being representative landscape, a captured landscape. The library, uh, the, the council had an ambition for it to be a very s a significant civic building, the opposite to where libraries have been going for a little while where, um, um, you know, every, people would ask, oh, the book's dead, you know, uh, as if. Um, why are we building a library? They wanted to make a very strong gesture about that. And so it's, it fitted in with um, the great traditions of Melbourne, which is establishing institutions of learning, of knowledge, and then even with utilitarian buildings, um, celebrating their significance <coughs> as public institutions. And so they all would have this sort of dome um, signifier and then quite an elaborate civic garden around them. The library itself is an incredible tradition. Um, British um, Museum Library and our own uh, State Library. 
So the building is that we gradually work towards was a dome, and the interesting thing about the dome is it both represents the past and the future, and people can read it as both past and future. The original feasibility proposed this is the library, um, and this is a sort of standard way that people now think about the library. They are, dealt, um, they are um, contemporary libraries have to be flexible. They have to carry all of the um, cleverness of a, a traditional office building, a modern office building because of the technology and the changeability of them. So the feasibility lacks certain civic quality, you might say. Um, uh, not done by us. Um, but it does show the sort of requirements of a flexible building. The council asked us to do three concepts. And so having this idea about la um, landscape, the natural and the building together, we prepared these three concepts. The one on the, um, on the far left was the idea that the landscape would embed itself in the building. Uh, the one in the middle was the idea of the building would actually wrap over um, sort of like an atrium, a green atrium. And uh, the dome option, which we were hoping they would choose, uh, was actually a, a dome that actually gets eaten away with the landscape sort of coming over it. That's the one where the, the start of the one where the landscape started to come into the building. This was the scheme that had the, uh, um, the sort of glass atrium. And the dome, when we showed these, um, they said, go back through those three, and they said, can we actually have that one? <laughs> You're there, oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> so instantly they chose the one, which was the dome. I, I, it was just amazing. Um, the, what it abuts is the Peace Memorial, which is um, obviously more elaborate than that, and you'll see it later, but um, the Peace Memorial was built in 1930, um, and it was a, intended as a foyer for a much bigger building that was never built. So we thought, well, we can make it look like it was built. If we go back to that proposition about the building and the and nature, well, the ruin becomes a fantastic. Um, and we, a lot of projects we work on, I think we're constantly coming back to the ruin. The ruin, the cave, the grotto appears in many projects. So in fact, the, the building is all of those things. It's both. Uh, uh, captures a sort of traditional, the tradition of the dome, but it's also futuristic. Um, designing on the inside, one of the big things was to try and get the outside to come in. So these are sort of us, just these are working computer screen grabs, just to make sure that we get enough visibility out to the park. Um, the ground floor level, the main, uh, one of the main issues with the um, with the librarian Patty Manolis was that they wanted a cafe, they wanted the cafe to be part of the library, they wanted the library at the base level to be a drop in, not just books everywhere, which is quite a difficult thing to do, but to be able to come in, sit down, it's like a community hub, and then capture that view through to the, through to the park. So one of the things we did was we took all the books off the floor and we put in a sort of um, a catwalk area that the books um, captured and in fact this is a, a many 19th century um, libraries have this system um, with the books are stacked along the edge and then you've got these reading areas and in fact we captured that allowed the space to bleed out and for there to be kind of working spaces meeting spaces down at that ground level there's a lot of discussion about color this is Goethe's Color work. And we used um, this to think about how, the, as the, through the vertical rise of the building, we would capture um, that sort of moods of the of the building through its colour. Uh, the library rooms uh, picking up on the blue, so we actually had these sections that actually track through the building of blueness. And then there are many meanings of blue, but um, um, not the least being that dark blue represents some. Um, knowledge and seriousness. And so the use of the blue um, is actually right through the building, through the, through the library sections of the building, um, to kind of thematically um, encapsulate that proposition. And the librarian said, we don't, this blue has got nothing to do with football, has it? <laughs> um, even in the toilets. <laughs> Interestingly, it was very popular with the Geelong people. <laughs> the, the Heritage Centre, 
um, which is um, really part of the state archives. It's most, it's a very small section at the front on the floor, and the rest of it is huge compactus areas uh, with all local records for the Western Districts in it. So if you're doing um, any research, um, uh, title, old maps, whatever, it's all here, but mostly it's used by people doing family research. And so we wanted it to have a sort of clubby feel. So the deep, use of the deep red and um, uh, red furniture, uh, we hoped would capture that sense that it's, um, it's quite a strong um, space, but it has a sense that it's not uh, a bureaucratic space, which many of these um, uh, records rooms are. So in fact, there's areas where you can sit and research. And then the very top, because of the dome space, our brief was to have a couple of meeting rooms but the dome actually gives you a whole space at the very top of it. And so, in fact, what we ended up with is a very large um, dividable convention space, which is used by the, by the group. Back to that idea of the grotto. And in fact, capsulating that in the building that faces very strongly west, so the serration of the facade meant that we could limit the amount of direct western sun we got. And it also meant that the building didn't have a sharp edge, that in fact in certain areas it actually hangs over, so it hangs over into the park. And so from the upper levels, and particularly right up the top, you're actually like looking at the tree. And then the planting that runs through, which is now grown, um, which actually comes up and there are therefore spaces at the upper levels where you can go out um, and sit outside up at the second and third level um, and look at, at the park. There's that red, that red room. Um, I guess the other thing that we have also been very strong on is that um, um, while we dearly love Adolf Loos, and I'm an absolute fan of Adolf Loos because of his, um, he was both an architect and a writer and a cultural critic, he did a very interesting article, article on women's underwear, he would give a very interesting article on men's shoes, He's just a genius. But he also um, unfortunately decided that ornament was linked to crime. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in a somewhat racial um, uh, rant, um, equated the Papuan tattooing with, uh, with primitive. Said they were primitive, we don't do that anymore. Um, we've uh, always been uncomfortable with that proposition. The idea of, I mean, the Maori tattoos, are they fantastic? Um, and there's a little bit of tradition in European architecture of the decorated, which is not too bad. <laughs> the the, the Norman brothers are pretty good. So we've always been interested in the idea of the elaborated surface and, and what that is and how you actually generate a, a next generation of decoration of the decorated. Um, a recent project that we did for Melbourne University Arts West um, actually attempts to deal with that in a quite fulsome way. Um, the project was uh, a new arts faculty, in fact probably the only arts faculty that's been built in Australia universities for the last 20 years because mostly they're medical or science. The arts faculties don't really get a look in. But Melbourne University's arts faculty is the original faculty. Um, they have the most amazing collection of artefacts and those artefacts are rarely available to students um, so the idea of scholarship, the actual studying of original um, elements was denied and so this new project, which was teaching space, but it was also uh, a, a, um, a way of creation of some spaces where the artefacts could be brought to the university and the students could study them firsthand. So the, uh, we took on the, the proposition about the idea that um, the collection is the building and the building is then available for study. And there's this sort of idea of the tradition of the um, cabinet of curiosities. And um, that, that tradition, um, Soans is the most magnificent. Um, a, 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 um, a decor, which is a very beautiful spatial relationship, but also elaborated by these thousands of objects, which actually make the space into something even more powerful. So the spaces are actually um, developed in a very pragmatic way. Like the, like the library, it's essentially an office building. There's a grid that allows these spaces to be 30 spaces, 60 spaces, 150 spaces, all changed. 
um, and then serviced in that way. But the decor is actually picks up on a number of thematics that run through the building, the chinoiserie, the Venice, the uh, Moorish, the, of course we had that the Scottish. <laughs> Can't do it that time. <laughs> and so the rooms are actually, and these are um, teaching spaces, are actually decorated in this way. And they're, and they're all different through the building, and each of the rooms then carries this sort of narrative <clears throat> structure for the time. Oh. It's not, a, it's actually Vivian Westwood. <laughs> <laughs> the chinoiserie. <clears throat> Um, the postgraduate library, which is um, essentially a um, read books collection, and then um, rendered in the way that the um, 18th century libraries, medical school libraries, or uh, in this sort of the, the rare collection, but it's a sort of meeting room as well. There's a sort of Moorish space, even the little interview rooms which carry this sort of Venetian um, imagery. And then the, the, the big meeting room, which is got this very beautiful rose uh, um, wallpaper. And even the lifts carrying um, actually the image of the um, entry into the car park. I don't know if many of you know. Um, I think it's called um, Atlas, Atlases, or um, the sculptures from the. Oh, there they are. So, the building, so um, the inside of the building is elaborated in the same way as the, the um, Japanese room is in the, um, in the design, was in the original architecture school and now it's been rebuilt, a disassembled room brought in. So this idea of a, a tradition that's been sort of ruled out by modernism, you can't do that, would bring that back in. But it also goes to the, uh, another aspect of the, the uh, tradition of the campus is the cloister. And so there's a track of cloisters a lot along through the art school and through the, um, the um, law school. Um, we continued that. The building is right next door, so we continued the, the ant track across and used this structure to a new uh, contemporised um, cloister that runs through. The cloister actually also runs inside the building and winds back to a stair that allows you to get up to some, uh, sort of a study area um, and then up through the building. The building is actually new um, but it abuts uh, a 90s building which is <coughs> the very left hand side and behind where this camera shot is the Bailey Library. That actually makes this space between the new and the two existing uh, sections into this sort of central courtyard. <coughs> we tried to ensure that the space um, would have that feeling of an outdoor um, courtyard without it being um, an, feeling like an atrium, a corporate atrium. So there's a lot of felt lining, all those walls are lined in felt so that there's no echoey noise. Um, and then wrapping the outside cloister back in and capturing what's actually a steel from Cardoro in Venice. I don't know if you've been there. The set, you come in through that central section into the courtyard and there's a very beautiful stair that winds up and back around. We've used, we took that as a steel to um, capture that sort of sense that you are in a courtyard that then you would go up to the Piano Nobile and this stone also is taken from that same courtyard. So the student, this is a student's um, study area where this photo is taken from and you look down on that. And then when you get right up you can actually get a sense of the, um, the space and therefore all of the student activity, the meeting and getting together is actually out on this sort of open courtyard and on the outside. The outside of the building, we had some difficulty with this, this particular issue. The outside of the building we presented um, as also carrying imagery from the collection. And we um, used the, um, the amazing uh, churches of Portugal um, and the narrative that's actually on the outside of these depicted in the blue tiles. So this is a tradition of, of architecture. You've got a, an arts, um, faculty which studies the history and traditions and culture of you know, all sorts of um, uh, aspects of the way culture is developed. Therefore, we wanted to pick that on the outside of the building. So from the collection, we took a series of images 
This is, in doing this, I must say, every time we do this, it's a political nightmare because <laughs> the university then has to say, well, has to get consensus about the right images. No, that's to 19th century patrician. That's to uh, colonialist. That's to, so to get three images through is quite a task. But in any case, they did it, they adopted it, and uh, it was very, very good that they did. So in fact, these are arranged, the start of a range. Joseph Banks and William Shakespeare got kicked out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Tommy McRae rightly was kept in. Um, the others um, that the builders referred to as cat on a horsey. Maybe <laughs> laugh when they used to say that. Um, and um, the, the bell crater images that were taken from that. They are then um, transformed through a computer program. They are then embossed onto the outside. The, the outside of the building is a series of metal fins, which are actually sun shading. We made models of them to see if you could see them. Interestingly, up close, they make this amazing sort of ice um, terrain. Or, for those who remember Joy Division, the cover. <laughs> Which was actually the death of a, um, a star, I think, trapped by them. But um, they, so up close they completely disappear, but they make this beautiful terrain. And then from the outside, now, um, a number, we had to go through four or five university aesthetics committees, and one of the committees was concerned that it was too explicit, you could see it too, it's too literal. I don't actually even know what that means, too literal. <laughs> um, so we introduced this sort of banknote swirl, so some of the images um, are harder to see under certain light, or in some instances they say, is that an image? No, it's just a swirl. <laughs> <laughs> and um, on, on certain times of the day you can see it, and in many instances um, the, the university ran a, a, a competition to get the students to find the images and then name them. And the students would use their phones, and as soon as you put your phone up, you go, oh, wow, there it is. So, um, uh, politically difficult to get through, a lot of work to get through, but in fact, actually, now, we're very happy with the way this has turned out. The interesting thing about this is they ran a survey recently, and it's the most, uh, amongst the student body, the um, it's something like an eighty percent more likely to go to the to the classes and to attend the building than compared with any other building on the on the campus. So the spaces that we made have been completely adopted by the students. There are heaps of selfies in um, in the toilet, um, in the lift. So we think that's pretty successful. Um, Charles, you mentioned we'll be talking about culture. <laughs> <laughs> Part of that, like the Geelong um, process, is to find a cultural narrative. This is Mar Marion Cultural Centre, which we've done quite a while ago now. Um, uh, a tiny little building in a suburb which has no town hall. Um, and the, in South Australia, the suburb is known for its shopping centre, the Marion Shopping Centre, a bit like Chadston. Um, so the municipal library needed some presence. It's on quite a busy um, South Road area. So we designed it as um, to have the presence, a street presence, like a um, petrol station, to, have, to be a big sign. So in fact, it's M-A-R-I, there's an O on the ground, and then there's an N coming, greenery. So it actually says Marion, and it, all of its uh, naming is up to the front, Great uh, bit of work here by Ed Rishi. Um, so, so that sort of, I guess we plunder these sorts of imagery, or we absorb them, or we find inspiration in these sorts of studies, which relate to the, the roadside, in this case, the roadside imagery. Um, I'll go come back to that. Um, Charles mentioned the William Barak, um, and the, the significance of it, one end. Um, essentially, um, you know, white history marked by the shrine or, or the making of the nation recognised by the shrine. 
and then the elder who to watch over the city of William Barak um, on the other end of the of the civic spine, we thought was was the right right thing for it to do. And that's actually an Adolf Losian idea that all buildings have two um, uh, personalities: they have an interior which is about the private, and they have an exterior which is about the community and the civic. So all buildings have a civic role, whether they're private or public. The shrine, so this, um, this is a sort of a, a, a presentation about attempting to find a cultural narrative through the project. And for people of, um, of my generation, our generation, Charles, um, the shrine represented uh, quite a negative aspect because we were in the, my marble didn't come up, but I still had to register for mm -hmm. Vietnam. Um, so there was a lot of you know, mixed feeling about doing the project. But on the other hand, um, the, the sense of uh, recognition of our, our elders um, and the values of our elders, um, the shrine represents that lineage. The shrine is an unusual memorial because it's um, a different sort of memorial. It's, it says on there, this is sacred ground. And the idea of that comes from the American Civil War where after a number of really terrible battles, the American government bought land um, at Antietam and kept it as sacred land. Kept, they kept farming it, but it was recognised as sacred site. So the land became um, a, a site in itself. And the shrine is that tradition. The shrine is the opposite to the tradition of the um, up until really 1900 idea about a memorial where it celebrated either victories or um, you know the great generals or whatever. It celebrates everybody who served. And I think it's only Australia and New Zealand who um, uh, commemorate the serving, not just the, those who died. Um, and it's a kind of um, uh, a completely different memorial in that way because it also celebrates a loss <coughs> rather than a, a victory. The competition that was done, the Hudson and Wardrop scheme um, for architects to lessons here, Hudson and Wardrop did the scheme. John Monash was one of the judges. Um, it, it's, it's spoken of as being um, a representation of Morsellus's tomb. Morsel, no one knows what Morsellus's tomb looks like. So during the 19th century, there were endless drawings of it based on the description from the ancient texts, um, including Ulysses S. Grant's tomb. Uh, Monash was a great fan of Ulysses S. Grant and knew the tomb. So Hudson and Wardrop very cleverly <laughs> did a scheme that said, I don't know where it came from, it's just a wonderful new idea that we had. <laughs> Somehow, Mono said, I like that one. <laughs> it's also actually taken from another um, uh, building in Washington, the Scottish Rite Temple. But anyway, so the building uh, stands as sort of a, a quite remarkable cultural element um, across generations and across political views. It, there's a tendency for it to be, you know, overly militarised and more recently, um, there's all sorts of creepy things that go on around that, but, you know, the, the memorial stands um, in spite of that. One of the, our project was to um, overcome the problems. It was essentially a project to put a disabled ramp in because the diggers couldn't get in and they had to suffer the indignity of pushing a button and being carried in. So um, the Shrine Trustees said, we want you to find a way to get in. So we designed a visitor centre over here, which is, you know, potentially every architect's a year, we get to do a beautiful building, and we put a tunnel in under. And every scheme we did, not that we showed many of them, they just looked ridiculous. Like, it looked like a toilet block in the park, it looked like a silly, overly formal, crazy thing. Everyone was a dud. And, um, we just thought this is not working, this is not a good way to do this against what is this sort of immutable thing. Oh, including um, the, uh, another garden, and you could get in and go around and under, to which the trustees said, Oh, what's this? A memorial to the Third World War. So we worked away and tried to think up other ideas. Now, there's a, there's a, a a structure to the site which has got these um, cross um, diagonal um, symmetry. It's got a cross symmetry 
which Hudson and Wardrop picked up on and put these um, bastions on the edges, and in fact the paths then lead off from those. They never built these because we didn't have enough money, ran out of money. So our idea was therefore we would do those bastions only instead of them going up, they would actually go down. And so force uh, diagonal symmetrical um, um, courtyards would be sunk, which allowed us to get down and in underneath the shrine so we could get in and run a lift up through the, one of the um, uh, foundation blocks. Mm -hmm. This is the earliest scheme which we presented. And um, Heritage Victoria said, um, no, it might be on the wrong track here, chaps. That's looking a bit too much like the original. You've got to think of, it's, it's got to be demonstrably new. So we came up with these, um, these elements which were new, which we'll come to. The other thing is the architecture has a very strong storytelling. All the sculptures, all of the, um, the text within it, the flags, the banners, all tell a story about what the, what the values of the shrine are. So we thought it needed to continue to tell that story. So the courtyards then developed this sort of appearance. And it was done firstly for the visitor centre, which finished in 2003. And this sort of shape was developed, which is actually take, it's a similar sort of string structure is made that actually wraps around down Swanson Street and then wraps around the shrine and where it comes through it marks these spots. But we thought we'd have trouble getting that through. You can see them there. And in fact, um, this old picture of from the research shows during the Second World War um, uh, when um, uh, Douglas MacArthur had his headquarters in here, there were, there were um, uh, trenches all dug in the, in the gardens. And that, so that zigzag line actually allowed us an opportunity to, to make, to, um, I guess, validate that, um, that uh, particular shape. We um, used the original uh, tone on granite. We couldn't get it from the original quarry because it was flooded, but next door there was a, a quarry that was used for road metal, um, which allowed, and they had some big boulders there which allowed us to um, cut the stone and use the, the original stone. The, in, the interior of that courtyard. We looked at a lot of ways to do that courtyard, but just came up with that idea of the boarded concrete, um, taken from this sort of various bastions, but also trenching. Um, the colour, uh, this is um, C.W. Bean's um, <coughs> official history, which I have half of that set. Um, and the colour, when Bean published this, um, these books, he wanted the colour of dried blood on the, um, on the book itself, so he's a bit of a fanatic. Um, and so we actually sent this to the paint company in the UK, this is concrete stain, to actually get that. And there's four different colours in that, including purple, which you can't see in that photo. And that's, they actually developed a colour which would match the uh, C.W. Bean's book. Then the other thing is we graffitied it. So it says, lest we forget, in the tradition of um, a sort of a gesture to youth, you might say. Um, doing that, I mean, this, this is just you know, the way architects work. You mock it up and you get these steel plates and fix it to the concrete and then you sandblast that out. This looked pretty good, actually. We really wanted to keep that on there, the steel plates. <laughs> the entry doors pick up on the other Crucifix, St Andrew's um, uh, crucifixion. The Peace and Remembrance Memorial, which has got the olive tree in it. It's taken from uh, the Dardanelles and the Middle East landscaping. And the um, olive tree is actually a tree that was planted in the 60s in the gardens, which we actually, uh, eight months before, gradually cut it out of the ground and then lifted it up and put it into the, into the memorial. So it would capture that thing of peace. And it's also because it had been planted in the 60s, it comes from the site. In that same garden, we looked at the Second World War bastions and um, fortifications and used a different, rather than the boarding, we used that sort of same theme, but from a different period. Um, you can see this sort of um, 
this is just after it opened, these bay laurels have um, grown a lot and the trees grown a lot too. And then in 2011, after much um, advocating and lobbying, um, we got the money to do the other two courtyards. Um, and also then use the undercroft for the galleries of remembrance that had always been hoped for. So in fact, underneath the whole area, which had looked like that, which is just amazing space, like there's nothing like it in, in Australia. Um, just found object, just cleaned it up, um, painted the underside of the, um, the replaced terrace because it had been leaking so much, they'd replaced it years before. Took out the earth floor and put in a new floor and created the galleries in there. Now the galleries. <coughs> now we get two new courtyards, a student entry courtyard because um, it, there's a whole uh, educational curriculum for the secondary students of Victoria to come to the, to the shrine. Um, and then a, a public courtyard on the western side. The terrace courtyard, um, we decided to thematically uh, pick that up with the Pacific and the traditions and plantings of the Pacific. So in fact, the, um, the planting in there, the way that it's laid out all recall that um, Michael Wright and Kath Rush, who did the landscaping, this did a fantastic job, including growing many of the trees at home a few years before because they were very hard to get. Um, the vent, which actually draws all the air into the air conditioning, was covered with the names of all of the um, places where people who signed up, enlisted, had listed as their name. So there are many names of places on here that don't exist anymore. And that's from the, um, 1939 through to 1960. The pattern on the concrete in this case is this, um, it's the desert, it's our um, camouflage, our desert camouflage. And the students' entry um, courtyard, we've built this giant poppy as a shade. There's a, a little amphitheatre here where the students come in and have an orientation. So capturing that in that, um, that's, a, that's an engineering marvel that um, Owen Consult worked out how to get that to cantilever from the centre out. That's putting it in place, many of us having a little bit of a heart attack. <laughs> um, Dennis Bagley, who was the uh, chief executive, said he was going to send a picture to the Queen after um, she had all those that, um, um, fields of poppies and said, that's not a poppy, that's a poppy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, don't do that, Dennis. Um, we didn't plan this, but the students are all given a poppy um, when they go into the tour and they come out and they stick it in these holes. These holes are actually the ode to remember, uh, remembrance um, in Morse. So um, the students just come out and did that, which was pretty good. And not only is it Morse code for the ode of remembrance, it's also a map of the world. And you can see there where you come in when it's back in the evening. The, uh, well, it's just um, Southeast Asia and Australia. And the entrance from that area up into the, up into the, rejuvenated undercroft. We found these, um, so that the, most of the people who built it were returned soldiers who were, had, couldn't get work. It was a depression project. And some of them left their, Lewis left his face there. And some of them left little markings that are through the, they haven't been, they're not, you can find them, but they're not signposted. So um, we didn't want to highlight them. So they're just dotted through the undercroft. Um, but getting this in was quite a task. It's very big, and um, they have to be able to get it out. It's on loan from the um, Canberra War Memorial. So we had to make this amazing grass covered <laughs> entry, the back door, it was called, <laughs> which actually lifts up and the boat goes in. But they also use it for their temporary exhibition loading. And they <coughs> in the boardroom, we took a Will Dyson image and then uh, printed it and folded it into the room. And the last, I get right down to the, you know, this, you can be probably a bit too obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> the Lone Pine died. Um, it, got, it got a fungus and died. So 
Um, Dennis Begley uh, wisely had it milled and stacked for two years while we did the work. And then we got a very brilliant furniture maker to make this most beautiful table. Wow. It's got blue cast in it, which is the mould, which is the fungus. Um, and, uh, and now that sits in the, in the board room. This was one of the more controversial elements. There's a, a small auditorium, 120 seater in there. Um, it needed an acoustic treatment on the walls. And um, we had to work through what that could possibly be. And a fellow in our office came up with the idea of using the peace crane. Um, and the, there was some difficulty with the trustees and quite a bit of discussion about it because it's a Japanese, it's to do with Hiroshima. And yet they wholeheartedly, in the end, adopted it as a, a reconciliation of that idea of, of, uh, of remembrance and, um, I guess, sort of the, the true issues of what war can do. And I, I always feel that, you know, I'm so proud of those guys to say, yeah, we'll go with it. <coughs> the red is actually taken from Victoria Cross River. And the last um, project that I'm going to show is a little house that we've done. Um, and it also picks up on um, this, this particular panel was done for um, Peter Corrigan's exhibition, Cities of Oak 2, um, some years ago. Um, and he asked us to show a project, but also have some statement with it. And my statement on the end there was this idea of there's no singular ecology in architecture, but just a revelation of compulsive joining. And then a quote from the surrealist, beautiful as the chance meeting with a dissecting table, on the dissecting table with a sewing machine and an umbrella. So that proposition about the disjuncture of things as they come together and what that reveals is kind of what I think what we've always tried to do within it. One of the things we've always tried to do within our architecture. The house is in Elwood. That's what it, um, it's the, on the on the left hand side was the house that was on there. Um, the proposal was to build two townhouses at the front and then build a house at the rear, um, accessed through this kind of um, what are they called? It's a uh, patio. They're called, aren't they? The long uh, courtyard. The two houses that were at the front, um, that's them. The project was to, at the rear, which is the house, was the beginning of an idea um, that comes from working on the shrine, but also the idea of articulating space through columns. So the opposite to empty space. The idea of the open plan that is actually modulated by, the, by a spread of columns. Um, and so this was... This, uh, kind of an attempt to deal with um, pre-modernist space, that is the pre-empty space, but that is still open, still an open plan. And the early sort of discussions that have come from sort of Renaissance painting were the use of perspective, where the column, the placing of columns within a view articulates it through its perspectival depth. Um, and so this, this one in particular, there's an ambiguity about the space because you've both got it um, inside, but then it comes out. And the as, as the columns come out, it appears as though the space comes out, even though it's not fully enclosed. Couple that then with the idea of, of working in the shrine was this idea about mass, and rather than everything being light, and you know it's uh, open at the top, it's a sense that space is articulated by a sort of a mass, a suspended mass, which um, the vault gives you. The vault is an interesting uh, spatial experience. Um, the bit that's underneath the cathedral, um, or the bit that's on, the, on water, water edges where the vaults are. So that sort of sense of spatial articulation was also part of this. Um, bear in mind that there is the wonderful car park at Melbourne University. Well, just put that in for reference, <laughs> and that's the shrine. But then there's the other aspect with this being under and then being over. So um, um, that sort of proposition about the village in the air 
and the floating, the, the positive, strangely uh, liberating sense of being, um, you know, beyond. So we start to start to design this with the with the columns as they were, and working through both a sense of that space where the columns come out and where they're inside, and then the thing that's on top. If we go back to that. In this case, the sort of the the village in the sky. Um, in another um, Renaissance painter's technique was to to give a sense of distance by creating these fantasy villages with multiple perspectives beyond, which gave you a sense that they were away. So in fact, we start, started to work on this look, this um, structure. It does go to that thing about surrealism, you know, the, the, strat, the complete juxtaposition of things as they hit, what does that do? The sort of aberrant and un impure juncture. The columns then were laid out um, to make the spaces, and we um, made them as though they were an endless field that had been cut off by this outdoor room. Building those is no easy feat, I have to say. The reinforcing is quite difficult to make. And then making the columns is quite tricky. Um, fiberglass forms. Um, when you strip them, when they strip them, this is actually our house. Um, <laughs> Jewel was next door. Um, and the guys who were doing the concrete pulled the first form off and she could hear them go, yeah, beauty! Because <laughs> they didn't really have any idea how to do it. But they did a, they did a fantastic job. Uh, the plan is, you can see here, it's essentially an open plan with a kitchen in the corner and then some spaces and an up there space which has got a couple of bedrooms <coughs> in it. Those the columns make this open space, they articulate it, they're not on a grid, they're actually arranged in a kind of picturesque way. So they actually mark certain sections of the room. They're in, they're like you have to walk around them to go up the stair. Um, then when you're inside and you look out, you can see the columns that actually go out into the garden come out into the garden and mark that space. Um, that's quite a deep eave. There are three garden areas which are also critical to the way the house is designed. There's the courtyard, which we just saw. There's a kind of green garden, and there's the patio. That is that courtyard area and the vista into the vista in and out. So while the space flows out, it then becomes a different sort of room. That's articulated in the columns with the village beyond. Building these was, that's just off form concrete, that's no mean feel I can tell you. <laughs> then the green garden, which um, is, the, is to the uh, east, which has grown more than this now. And then the uh, entry um, uh, patio, of which, um, We've just recently installed a nice new work of art by a very fine artist who's in the room tonight. Oh. <laughs> Ash, how are you? <laughs> so, um, Ash did this amazing work, um, which was um, bolted to the walls. Um, I can stop there. <laughs>